Let me ask you a question. Do you think bite mark comparison evidence should be admitted in criminal trials? Its proponents would point to cases like the Ted Bundy case. Bundy was a serial murderer. He was eventually caught in Florida and convicted in large part on the basis of bite mark comparison evidence. He had unusual dentition, that's the, the patterns of his teeth. And so hypothetically, at least it was relatively easy to match his dentition to the bite marks of his victims. The detractors would point to wrongful convictions like this one, the case that we'll be talking about today, the Keith Harward case. Harward was convicted of a rape and a murder in Newport News in 1982. He spent most of his adult life in prison. He was eventually exonerated in 2016. It was a DNA exoneration, and it clearly pointed to the actual assailant, a man by the name of Jerry Crotty. In the meantime, Crotty had actually died in a prison in Ohio for a different defense in the mid-2000s. Harvard, Harvard was released. He got $1.6 million settlement from the state of Virginia as part of this uh, as, as part of the uh, exoneration in, his, in this case. This is where it all happened in Newport News. Uh, over here, you'll see the shipyard and the 50th Street entrance, which will play a major role in our case. Uh, over here, you'll see the railroad tracks. So, And then in between this green area is a residential area where the incident, actual criminal incident occurred. And so you can see it's kind of nestled in between the shipyard and the railroad tracks. It isn't necessarily high-end real estate in that regard. In fact, I visited Newport News in preparation for this video and to take some pictures of that kind of thing that you'll see is in the video and witnessed a, for the first time in my life, a hit and run accident. So uh, an individual not, that was, didn't hit a person, but hit a car come screeching around the corner, right around the house where this murder occurred and rammed into a car on the side of the road and then went screeching off. We called the police and all, the, all of that kind of thing. So the neighborhood still has its challenges, uh, shall we say, maybe because of some of the transient nature of a lot of the people who live around you know, na uh, Navy and, and, and military bases, uh, hard, hard to say. So, uh, the family in question who was victimized, and I'll say straight off just to reassure you, the three small children involved here were not directly victimized in this case. Uh, their parents, however, were. Uh, they were Jesse and Teresa Perone. They were in their early 20s, and they had three small children, and they lived in a little house in Newport News in that little green area I just showed you. The actual murders occurred in the early morning hours of September 14th. On the 13th, Teresa Perone had taken the children to the Doris Miller uh, community pool, uh, community center, the pool at the center. Uh, and I assume they had a good time as she was leaving. The important thing that happened at that point is a man in a sailor's uniform yelled and cursed at her, uh, presumably with the expectation that she was going to give him a ride of some sort. I don't know why anyone would ask a mom with three small children for a ride. That seems incredibly inappropriate just in and of itself. She wound up uh, getting the kids in the car, getting home. And that evening when she was hanging laundry out to dry in the backyard, uh, an another man actually uh, yelled some kind of insult at her. Uh, so she was having a rather unusual time of it on the 13th just from that alone. Uh, that night, uh, she wound up waking up in the middle of the night, uh, and her husband was being assaulted by a stranger. Uh, the stranger had a crowbar and was beating uh, her her husband. And um, uh, and then that murderer, realizing that uh, she was a, a was was there and was a, was waking up, uh, wound up uh, uh, on on top of her, and then finishing off the job of murdering her husband. The assailant said he didn't mean to kill the husband, which seems kind of unusual claim to be making at that point. But he also said that he would harm the children if she did not cooperate. So uh, she wound up being sexually assaulted for several hours that uh, night. There were a couple of things that uh, happened at that point uh, dur during that period. First is that both she and the assailant wound up smoking at least one cigarette each. Uh, there wound up being three cigarette butts that were recovered from the scene, um, and she was bitten multiple multiple times. So those uh, wound up being rather rather important kinds of evidence in the case. It appears that the assailant came in through the uh, uh, gate in the back fence, 
around where she had been hanging the laundry earlier that evening. The, the fence was not built in such a way that it was a proper security fence or anything like that that could keep somebody out. Um, the assailant was able to uh, get into that break into the house also relatively easily and then wound up um, escaping out that gate as well. Um, uh, Jesse Perone had been killed with a crowbar. There was a, there were a number of hairs that were collected at the crime scene. And what they were really hoping is that Jesse Perone had been able to grab the hair of the assailant because there was a fairly large clump of hair that was found in his hand. But as it turned out, that was a defensive gesture. He had been somehow, he had clutched his head either as a defensive gesture, or we don't really know all of the details of that, and had clutched it so tightly that he had pulled his own hair out. And so the so all of those hairs were associated with uh, Jesse Perone. They never really were able to associate any hairs from the scene, at least in terms of the morphological comparison of those hairs, with um, uh, anybody in the case other than the uh, any any and other than the Perones. Teresa Perone did survive the assault. She called the police, and then she wound up going to the local hospital, where a uh, physical evidence recovery kit was taken. Uh, this included taking taking swabs from. Uh, uh, from from all the places where uh, biological evidence would have been deposited by the assailant. In addition, they saw and photographed bite marks that had occurred uh, as part of the assault. So uh, what they would do is they actually swabbed the uh, bite marks in the hopes of picking up the saliva of the assailant. Now, at this time, there was not DNA, so uh, they would not have been able to run this as we would today through the DNA database and get, hopefully, a match to the suspect and identify the suspect pretty pretty, uh, uh, pretty well, right? Uh, they had uh, serology, though, which could be used to do things like blood typing the assailant, things of that nature, and that was eventually done, and it was part of the facts around the forensic science actually in the case. She had been bitten multiple times during the, assault, during the assault. She was bitten on her thighs. She was bitten on her calves. This was actually a very historic case. The detective in the case, a man by the name of Spinner, actually said it was like the most important case of his life. He was very, very proud of it, uh, in part because it was, uh, to, to their knowledge at the time, and to our knowledge today, it was the first case in Virginia involving bite mark evidence and a living victim. And so uh, in this case, we know definitively that the wounds on Teresa Perone were bite marks. This is unusual in the sense that uh, oftentimes you don't know because the victim uh, was killed, uh, whether a particular wound was a bite mark or not. And it isn't always as uh, straightforward as what you might see in, in photographs like the ones that you see behind me right now. They uh, uh, seldom is a bite mark on a victim nearly that clean. Uh, and, and you can actually have three different kinds of levels of bite mark that in, in, in a person, two of which are, are of no use forensically, certainly. One is where the uh, teeth do not penetrate the skin at all. And so you might have some redness uh, and bruising, but there's no pattern to the, to the bruising. And so the bite mark isn't strong enough to be able to associate with a particular biter. Uh, the other is where it's much, much uh, more violent and you have tearing of the flesh. Again, you can't get a pattern of the dentition out of that kind of a bite mark. But something in between where the teeth actually uh, penetrate the skin, but not too deeply. And so you can match up positions of the teeth, theoretically at least, with um, uh, the patterns that are, on, that are on the skin, that is what is considered a forensically useful bite mark. And there were forensically useful bite marks in, the, uh, in, in this case with Teresa Perone. And most importantly, she was able to say, yes, definitively, these are where the bite marks occurred. So they, that, this was a major, major part of the evidence in the, key, in the case. They also knew, based on her excellent eyewitness testimony, that the individual was likely associated with the shipyard. So she described a man who was uh, clean shaven, who had on a white sailor's uh, uniform, uh, 
Uh, and uh, she described an insignia on that uniform. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so the first thing they did was say, well, can we trace the case to the shipyard in some other way? So they brought in a police dog. The police dog actually um, uh, uh, followed the scent from the back of the Harvard house all the way down this particular street where the hit and run occurred that I happened to witness and all the way over to the gate of the shipyard. Now, this was uh, key at a later point, a, a guard at the 50th Street gate who was on duty that night came forward and said that around 5 a.m. he saw an E3 with uh, blood on his uniform and he said the uniform was very unkempt, he wasn't in proper order. Uh, had had come through the gate. He said the uh, individual did not acknowledge him as he went through the gate, but the guard said he definitely saw this individual uh, and was able to describe him. Both the guard and Teresa Perone uh, wound up being put under hypnosis in the hope that they could do a more definitive identification and description of this individual. Uh, as a result, some of their eyewitness testimony may not have been as reliable as it should have been. Hypnosis is not a very good way to elicit reliable memories from a witness of a crime. So in any case, he said he saw an E3. The reason why he said that is because he saw uh, uh, three stripes on the side of the uniform of the individual who went by. This was one area where he and his statement was discordant with that of Teresa Perone. Teresa Perone said she saw a chevron, uh, kind of three um, uh, nested Vs. Up, I think they're upside down nested Vs, yeah, uh, on the shoulder, which would be a different uh, ranking. They wound up going with the idea that was uh, uh, of, uh, from the guard and assuming that, the, that she had seen that incorrectly because she never really got a good look at the assailant in the dark. Uh, and therefore, maybe she didn't get a good look at the insignia. So they assumed it was an E3, of which there were a number uh, working at the uh, shipyard at that time. At the time, they were outfitting the USS Carl Vinson. As it turned out, Jesse Perone, Jer Jerry Crotty, and Keith Harward were all working on the USS Carl Vinson at the time. The, the Vinson is still in service. It is uh, one of the most powerful weapons of war ever uh, built. And um, and it was being outfit and it was pretty close to being done at the time of the uh, uh, of the murder and, and rape that day in or that night in 1982. Um, uh, there were a lot of welders like Jesse Perone was a welder. He had he had been trained as a welder and that's why he was working on the Vincent as a civilian. Uh, uh, both uh, Harvard and Crotty uh, uh, were uh, also assigned to the Vincent. Uh, at, but they were in they were they were uh, in in the Navy at, at that at that point. And so what they did was they um, actually what they did, the police did at that time was what is called a, 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 an unusual thing I've never seen in any other context whatsoever. That is a bite mark dragnet. And so you might see this. Um, I mean, when somebody does a DNA uh, database search, you're kind of doing a dragnet because you're basically saying I have this. DNA evidence from the case, from the from the crime scene, and I'm gonna just see whether I get a match to any of the millions of people in the DNA database. And instead of that, they said, well, I have this uh, these, these bite marks from the victim. I'm gonna see whether that is a match to any of the uh, sailors on the USS Carl Vinson. Now, um, to be fair in this case, the people who did that dragnet were not certified bite mark examiners. They were, there was a dentist from the Carl Vinson and there was a local community dentist who uh, were in charge of doing this bite mark dragnet. Both Crotty and Harward were brought in by the dragnet as, uh, uh, because they were you know, in the population, uh, but neither one of them was arrested or implicated at the time of that uh, original dragnet. Uh, as being the uh, assailant in the case. For whatever reason, those two dentists, uh, again, who really weren't bite mark examiners at, in their regular profession, they were just dentists, uh, uh, they were not able to make a, any kind of positive identification based on the dentition that they had been able, the dentitions that they were able to get. They were mostly operating off of dental records 
of the sailors. They weren't collecting new dental records or anything like that to a very large extent. So um, they, uh, one thing to note here is, is that there isn't enough variation among bite marks to have done this dragnet. So each person's DNA, unless they have a twin, identical twin, and even then there are variations, um, uh, is unique, right? And their fingerprints are unique. There are a lot of things like that in the world that you could use to do this kind of work, but you can't use bite marks because uh, they aren't unique enough to even sometimes distinguish among a group of three or four people, let alone among hundreds of sailors. And it was inevitable that they were going to find some people who were pretty close matches to the bite marks on the victim. And so the whole idea of the dragnet was to some extent, uh, you know, just poorly thought out uh, from, from the get-go. And they should never have even attempted that, even if they thought that the bite marks uh, could be used later on to help prove the case. The idea that you're going to use it as some sort of cold hit uh, like you would DNA is uh, almost absurd and really uh, completely invalid. Uh, a few months later, Keith Harward's girlfriend uh, went to the police to complain about him. She said that he had uh, bitten her, and um, uh, as a result, he became the prime suspect in this case uh, after his girlfriend uh, reported him to the police for that. They, uh, at that point then, they did take a cast impression of his bite mark, and two certified analysts were brought in, uh, including Dr. Lowell Levine, uh, who was a, a very well-respected forensic examiner, uh, not only among bite mark examiners, but across the forensic science community. And uh, Levine and another one by the name of Dr. A.W. Cagey uh, concluded that the bite, bite marks had been made by Keith Harward. At that point, uh, you know, things were pretty much over. He was arrested. This is a picture of him at the time of the uh, of, of his arrest for the murder of Jesse Perone and the sexual assault of Teresa Perone and the burglary of their of their home. And the case went to trial uh, and it was fairly well, um, fairly well covered at the time. There was actually two trials. His first conviction was overturned on a technicality. The Virginia law was not clear really about the idea that uh, if you uh, if you raped and murdered somebody, that was basically a capital offense. But if the rape occurred with somebody who was different from the person who you murdered, the law really didn't anticipate that situation. And so they had to retry Keith Harward, which they did and, uh, in 19, 1986. We don't have a lot of the transcript from, or any of the transcript from the original 1983 trial, but we do have the transcript from the 1986 trial. Here is Lowell Levine. He was the primary bite mark examiner. And one thing about Levine is, is that he was uh, one of the most well-spoken bite mark examiners or forensic scientists of any sort uh, around at that time. Uh, he uh, was a, a master at laying out his view about why uh, he came to the conclusions that he did in any kind of case. And he was uh, extraordinarily clear about his view that it was Harward who matched the characteristics in the bite mark. And this is what he this is what he said, which doesn't sound as articulate as what I just sold you on. There was a this is what he said. There was a quote, very, 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 very high degree of probability, unquote, that Harward made the bite marks. And it was, quote, a practical impossibility that someone else would have all these characteristics in the impressions. And so he was basically making the same case as what was made in the 10 Bundy case. And that is that there, that there were teeth that were canted sideways and there were other unusual aspects to Harvard's dentition and that he could see those patterns in the bite mark impressions and therefore was able to say that no one else on the planet Earth could have made that bite mark. Again, to be fair, this kind of testimony is no longer allowed by the American Board of Forensic Odontology. At the time of the trial, they allowed examiners, if they felt they, that the evidence um, would support it, to make what is called individualization testimony of the sort that you see on the screen right now. Basically, Levine saying that Harvard made the bites and no, no, no other source in the world could have made those bites. We, uh, uh, there, is, there was never any scientific validity to that. 
there's never been any scientific study that showed that that was possible. There is scientific, there have been scientific studies talking about the uh, uniqueness of dentition. That is that the patterns of the teeth themselves are reasonably unique. But even that has some issues today because of improvements in, uh, in, 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 in health, in dental health. And so a lot of young folks today might have teeth that would be very, very difficult to distinguish from other people who have extremely healthy and aligned teeth. There would still be, be, be some kinds of differences, but whether they would, they would be picked up in the Aluax impressions or other kinds of dental casts uh, is questionable to say the least. Um, today, the ABFO uh, only says that you can exclude somebody uh, from the uh, uh, from the from making the bite mark, or you can say, I just don't know uh, whether the person made the bite mark, and you could say I cannot exclude the person from having made the bite mark. And uh, uh, but but this testimony, this individualization testimony, uh, was even at, at the time of the trial very unusual and uh, would not have necessarily been looked on favorably by a lot of people in the profession. This was pushing the envelope, to say the least, on what bite mark could, 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 be, could, could do. So you'll, you'll see that language was very, very, very unusual. So uh, he mentioned Har one of Harvard's teeth was canted sideways. That was aligned with um, a bite mark in the photo that was taken uh, from Teresa Perum. And there was a hook type area in the wax position and the wax impression that appeared uniquely compatible with features visible in the photograph of the bite mark. He explained that there was a chipped area, there was, there, there was a chipped area in the teeth and breakage of the teeth that were present and distinctive in both the photo of the bite mark and the wax impression. So he was able to go to a great deal of detail in his testimony talking about the fact that Harvard's teeth uh, were unusual and that the bite mark displayed those unusual characteristics. This actually argues more against the use of bite mark comparison evidence today than almost anything else you could. If you have somebody who comes in, you have one of the top forensic examiners in the field, and you have very unusual dentition, it should be an easy open and shut identification if that were possible. But in fact, we know today that Levine was wrong. That the uh, that Harvard actually did not match the bite mark. Uh, the DNA shows clearly that he was not the assailant, and his analysis here, as impressive as it must have sounded to the jury, was wrong. And so, if somebody at that level of the profession could make a mistake, and and his ABFO certified colleague, Dr. Kagi, also made the same mistake, even though it was not a blind review. Um, th then that calls into question the validity of bite mark comparison very, very fundamentally. Uh, I want to make, I want to emphasize that, that KG did not make an independent conclusion. That is, after Levine had done his analysis and said that there was a match, uh, that was the, his material was given to KG, KG having been aware that Levine made a match, would have been under some stress, I think, to disagree with him. There is a level of, of deference and bias that occurs when you're aware of the prior examiner's conclusion. So they also did serology in this case. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the serology because it, it, it is relatively important. We do not know Jerry Crotty's uh, blood type. Uh, however, you'll see why I feel that he was almost certainly a non-secretor. Uh, uh, we do know Keith Harwards, he was an A secretor, and Jesse Perone, the husband, uh, this is not Jesse Perone, uh, was an O secretor, and then Teresa Perone uh, was a B secretor. So what this means is, is that uh, a, a, B, or O, that was their blood type. Secretor means that they secreted their blood group substances in bodily fluids other than blood. And so you would pick up their uh, uh, A, O, or B blood group substances in their, in their saliva, in, in semen or vaginal fluid, and things of that nature. Therefore, the sexual assaults uh, uh, samples or the saliva samples that were collected from the bite marks would show the uh, blood group substances of anybody who contributed to those, to those samples. And so 
let's go back to those cigarettes. So there were three cigarettes altogether, as I mentioned, that were that were recovered from the crime scene. Interestingly, two of them had B and H antigens. So uh, somebody who is a B secretor um, will actually have what are called H antigens. Those are associated with an O secretor uh, because uh, you make A and B antigens from the type H antigens that would be with your if you were an O type person. So anybody who's a B secretor will produce B and H antigens. So presumably those two cigarettes were smoked by Teresa Perone because she was a B secretor. So, but there was a third cigarette that had no antigen. So there's two two possibilities here. One is that whoever smoked that cigarette didn't leave behind enough saliva to be picked up by the test. The other, and I think more likely scenario, is that that individual was a non-secretor. This actually was discussed at the uh, at the trial. So the uh, uh, serologist in this case, a man by the name of David Pompassini, actually laid out both of those scenarios. And both of them are plausible scenarios. However, what the prosecutor did was say, well, what Pompassini says is that we don't know whether you know the assailants of uh, blood group substances would even be found on the cigarettes and therefore you know we don't you know the serology really isn't that valuable um and you could fault pompassini to some extent for not having clarified his testimony because he should have been able to say should those blood group substances be available should be seen or not more than likely i would assume that the blood group substances would have been found certainly there were no um a blood group substances that would have been from Keith Harwood found on those cigarettes. As it turns out, they weren't, his A blood group substances weren't found in the, uh, in the perk kit either. So the rape kit swabs showed H antigens associated with an O secretor. So this means that the B antigens associated with Teresa Pern also were not seen in those rape kit swabs. Therefore, these H antigens almost certainly had to come from the assailant. And therefore, uh, one could assume that the assailant was an O secretor. The one problem with that is if you look back at Jesse Perone and uh, uh, Teresa's husband, he was an O secretor. And therefore, it's very possible that those um, blood group substances had actually come from Jesse Perone uh, as part of uh, con uh, a consensual uh, uh, sex with his wife uh, around the time of the before the before the murder occurred, and therefore uh, this is also consistent with the idea that Jerry Crotty was a non-secretor. That is um, uh, Jesse Perone's blood group substances, as um, uh, an elimination sample showed up, but Jerry Crotty's did not. In any case, either way, this is exculpatory information because. Um, Keith Harvard's A antigens aren't seen anywhere. So what, where, why aren't you seeing his A antigens? Again, this was brought up at trial, and it was theorized potentially that you just wouldn't have seen um, uh, the, the assailant's uh, blood group substances, or maybe the assailant was a non-secretor. And again, just like with the cigarettes, it was discounted successfully by the prosecutor. It's interesting, actually, to see the uh, court case on this, because the, uh, the, the, the appeals court really um, uh, discounted this as well in how they viewed the, uh, um, the, the case. They said uh, the differences Harvard points to, that is Harvard's lawyers point to, don't show that he was innocent. The evidence uh, pertaining to bodily secretions was equally susceptible to an interpretation that no fluids were detectable as it is that fluids from a non-secretor were present. Such inconclusive evidence is not exculpatory. The fact finder cannot hypothesize a doubt from the absence of evidence, so long as all the circumstantial evidence excludes every reasonable hypothesis of innocence. But unfortunately for that interpretation, it doesn't hold up well knowing that he was actually innocent, because what you're actually saying is that all the other evidence was of such a nature that it showed Harvard must have been the assailant. But in fact, um, neither the guard nor the nor Teresa Perone was able to give a very definitive account of uh, uh, saying uh, uh, implicating Keith Harward. In fact, Keith Harward actually had a mustache 
And Teresa Perone said that the assailant was clean shaven. So even that didn't match up. The bite mark evidence was also in question. We know today that it was actually wrong. And the serology clearly was exculpatory. And it wasn't, an, uh, you know, a even, even so balanced, whatever. It's another case where at the time, if you wanted to, you could explain away any serology. You just say, well, you know, maybe we just didn't pick anything up. But in fact, these tests were extraordinarily sensitive. They should have picked up his A antigens on the cigarettes, um, in the uh, in in the uh, rape kit. Uh, they they did not, and also his hair, as I said, was not picked up at the at the scene either. But that bite mark comparison wound up really being uh, convincing to the trial court, to the jury, and uh, and enough to the appeals court so that they were willing to even look the other way, saying, well, we really don't know. The serology seems like it could go either way. So, um, uh, and they didn't, they didn't really took, take, a, take much, uh, much uh, truck with some of the other ideas. So just to re review that, to make sure it's clear, there, there are multiple interpretations. One is that it was exculpatory because his A blood group substances weren't found on any evidence. The two was it was inconclusive because the test may not have been sensitive enough to pick up the male fraction in, in the rape kit or on the cigarette for that matter. Or it was inconclusive because Jesse Perone contributed the H antigens because he was an O secretor. Or an alternate suspect, perhaps Crotty was a non-secretor. That's why the third sh cigarette showed no blood group substances and there were no foreign markers, quote unquote, in the rape kit. And and it's pretty clear today, based on what we know, that is almost certainly the theory that sh they should have relied upon in the Harvard case. He was convicted in any case. The court basically relied on this idea of what is called negative corpus. That is, <clears throat> we don't have evidence to exculpate him. The jury had every reason to believe that he was guilty. End of story, because you, you know, once you've eliminated all the other possibilities, he, he, he must have been the assailant. Harvard must have been the assailant. And so he wound up spending the next, um, you know, almost 40 years in in, in prison. And uh, this is this is again what they what they had said. We cannot hypothesize about a doubt from the absence of evidence. In 2015, the Innocence Project became involved in this case. They were looking for many uh, bite mark examination cases around this time. There's actually a book out now by Chris Fabricant. I'll uh, link to it in the description that talks about the Harvard case. I have not read that book, but I know that he was heavily involved uh, and and uh, honorably so in getting Harvard exonerated in this case. Uh, they got a court order for DNA testing. They found uh, that uh, Jerry Crotty was the actual uh, contributor of the DNA in the rape kit. Uh, he had already died, as I mentioned, in prison in 2006. In 2017, uh, the Virginia legislature did award Harvard $1.6 million compensation for his wrongful conviction. He has wound up uh, uh, being an advocate, as you might expect, uh, against the use of bite mark comparison evidence and other invalid forensic science in criminal trials. The Virginia Department of Forensic Sciences did do a review of, of the work of David Pompassini, the ser serologist in this case, they found what they said were no serious problems or wider issues. Keith Harward said at the time, I appreciate them at least attempting to do something uh, to, to look in, in, into, that, into that issue. Um, uh, this is actually a, um, uh, 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 from Keith Harward's uh, Instagram. Uh, he got a tattoo showing his uh, conviction date in 1983, his original conviction date. Um, uh, his exoneration date in 2016 and on April 7th, and uh, crediting the Innocence Project of New York City and his defense attorney, Skadden Law of Washington, D.C., in his exoneration. In the meantime, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't know uh, the extent to which Jerry Crotty had been able to victimize other uh, folks. Uh, in this case, as in many wrongful convictions, what we have here is we have the victims, uh, the, the Perone family, both directly and indirectly victims of this case. Uh, we have Keith Harward as the wrongfully convicted individual in this case who is a victim of this case. We have the other victims of Jerry Crotty uh, after he was not properly identified 
by uh, the investigation at the time of the original murder, uh, at least those victims in this case. So uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, the Perones find some solace in the fact that at least it is known what happened uh, on, on that night in September of 1982 today, and that Keith Harward, who was a victim in some ways just like them, has found some level of justice in this world as well. So I hope that was useful and you have an ability at least now to make your own judgment about whether bite mark comparison should be admitted in criminal trials in the United States.